All right, so we are now on our third panel of the day, um, and I have the privilege of introducing our moderator. Lori Rustino is a associate professor at Vermont Law School and the director um, of the Center for Agricultural and Food Systems. And before joining uh, Vermont Law School, she was senior counsel with the Office of the General Counsel for the United States Department of Agriculture. So you have an excellent moderator for this panel. And enjoy. It's a pleasure to be moderating this panel. It's kind of a rare treat to have so many people that are so deeply involved in this particular issue in Vermont. Um, and in this panel, we're actually bringing it all home. So this is about the new Vermont TMDL. And because uh, we're at a really watershed moment, if you will, um, we're really going to be focusing on the implementation. We're not going to talk a lot about the history that led up to it because it's such a rare opportunity to have people who really are the, the ones who got us to this point and also the ones who will be implementing. So um, uh, what we thought we'd do is, I have a series of questions I'm going to ask the panel. Um, we would like to have a robust discussion amongst the panel members. And then we're going to open it up with plenty of time for questions because we would like for you to have an opportunity to engage in a discussion with the panel members. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce them. Secretary uh, Markowitz is the Secretary of the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, the state agency with the primary responsibility for protecting Vermont's environment, natural resources, and wildlife for maintaining Vermont's forests and state parks. Uh, Secretary Markowitz believes that given today's challenges, Vermont must find new and creative approaches to care for its natural resources, to build strong communities, and to support its working landscape for a sustainable future. Uh, Secretary Ross, Chuck Ross, was appointed as the Secretary of the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets in January 2011 by, by Governor Pete Shumlin. Prior to his role as Secretary, he served for 16 years as a State Director uh, for the U.S. Senator Patrick Leahy uh, and six years as a State Legislator from Hinesburg, Vermont. Stephen Perkins is the Aquatic Ecosystem Program Manager with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 1, and has previously served as the Deputy Regional Administrator. His work focuses on large ecosystems suffering nutrient impairment such as Lake Champlain, Long Island Sound, and the Great Bay. Chris Killian is Vice President and Director of the Conservation Law Foundation in Vermont. He is also the Director, the director of the Clean Water and Healthy Forests. Prior to his work at CLF, Chris spent eight years with the Vermont Natural Resources Council. In 1988, Chris received the Charlie Shaw Conservation Partnership Award from the National Wildlife Federation. David Mears, Professor Mears, is director of the Environmental and Natural Resources Law Clinic. Professor Mears helps students hone their lawyering skills while assisting nonprofit organizations and individuals with environmental problems and conservation projects. Professor Mears returned to Vermont Law School in August 2015 after serving four years as Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, and we are very happy to have him back with us. So before getting into the questions, I do think it would be helpful to orient the audience as to uh, just a very brief history, and Professor Mears promised he would be brief, but he has, he has agreed to give us the uh, very nutshell version of the history of TMDLs uh, for Lake Champlain. And then after that, to actually ground us on the ground, to bring this uh, to reality, to really show us what, what this is about. Um, uh, Mr. Perkins has agreed very nicely to give us some visuals uh, from a PowerPoint and, and tell us generally really what's going on with these TMDLs and the pollution in, in that watershed area. So without further ado, Professor Mears, would you mind? Yes, I'd be glad to. So, uh, and, and I'm, this is gonna be hard for me to be brief, as those of you who know me can appreciate. Um, but I'll just start with following up on the, the, the lead end that we were given by Professor Houck, which is the, the I, I share his sense of optimism about Lake Champlain. And it's because in Vermont, people love Lake Champlain. It's just a fact. And uh, the issues we have are not whether to protect the lake or whether it's important, but how do we best go about doing that in a way that ensures actual, real, and meaningful progress. So why do we love the lake? 
it's an amazing lake. It's an amazing aquatic ecosystem, and it's huge. It's 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 in fact much better than the Great Lakes. It's one. It's the greatest lake, really, in the United States. <laughs> It would, if you had a motorboat that could conceivably go at 60 miles an hour, it would take you two hours to traverse the lake from end to end. It's about 12, 12 miles wide at its widest point. It goes as deep as 400 feet deep. There's points at which it's fairly narrow and it's more riverine. There's parts that it's wide and open and slow moving like a bay. It's an incredible lake, an incredible diversity of fish species, um, bird life, um, all sorts of, of uh, our economy is based on it. The recreational uses and benefits of the lake are extraordinary. So with all, and, and leading then into some of the challenges of, of some of that it's facing, and I would point to Mike Winslow back there. Mike, wait, raise your hand. If there, you should all meet Mike Winslow. You should get his book, which has a collection of essays about the lake and its incredible natural resources. Um, and I've drawn a lot of my facts um, over the time that I've been working on these issues from his book. But one of the things about the lake that makes it truly remarkable is the, the, the degree to which the watershed dwarfs the size of the lake. It's a, it's a huge lake, 435 square miles, but it's over 18,000, let me get make sure I have the number, eight, over more than 8,000 um, square miles of watershed that feeds into it. So it's not just a matter of like going along the shoreline and finding a few polluters and dealing with that. There's people in Cabot who may not realize it, but the actions that they take on the lake 60 miles away from where the Winooski pours into Lake Champlain that are having an effect. It may not be an immediate effect, but it's an effect. So that in, in the Lake Champlain watershed, you have to talk about every activity in that watershed if you're going to get at the sources of pollution. And there's a lot of things affecting the lake. There's invasive species, there's zebra mussels, there's the new spiny water flea problem. Um, there are uh, invasive fish species. There's a whole host of toxics and pharmaceuticals hitting the lake. But the single biggest problem that the lake has faced that we've known about since the early, well, for a long time, um, the, the first recorded kind of reports I've seen on this are in the 1970s. But we've known that phosphorus and nutrient pollution are a major stressor on the lake. That doesn't mean that there aren't other problems, and it's the combination of the soup of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that really are the right mix of things that help generate a lot of the excessive plant growth and imbalances in the ecosystem. And just, just because some of you may be like me, struggle to figure out how something like phosphorus, which sounds kind of interesting, that you might find on your cereal box on the list of nutrients that you want to get, um, why is that a problem? Um, Breck Bowden, a professor at the University of Vermont, had a metaphor, I thought, which was apt. If you think about, you've got a pile of boards, you know, two by fours and plywood in your backyard, enough materials to build a shed, but you don't have any nails. That's what, in its natural state, Lake Champlain is like. Phosphorus is the nails. Without the nails, without the phosphorus, the aquatic plant growth won't explode. The, the cyanobacteria populations will stay in, in a, a manageable way, and the natural balance that evolved over millennia in the lake can continue. But when you have phosphorus, excess phosphorus, which is a naturally occurring chemical um, uh, mineral that exists in all of you just step out here, dig up a, so a scoop of soil, it's got phosphorus. And when that, because of human disturbances, finds its way into the waters and makes its way into the lake, that's the problem we're dealing with. And we've known about that for a long time. So what are the sources? One of the major sources is agriculture. Uh, in Vermont and as across the country in agriculture, there's been an excessive amount of phosphorus applied. I don't know at what point someone figured out that more phosphorus made the plants grow bigger and it made the cows produce more milk. But in Vermont, when they did that, they started shipping phosphorus by the truckload and it was over applied in the state. There's also been a growth and a continuous trend towards um, putting more of the state's farmland to cropland. So corn and soy, the same kinds of issues that cause the dead, cause the dead zone in the Mississippi, are causing problems in Lake Champlain. You have a set of development issues, the development pressures, whether it's the roads or the parking lots, the rooftops, all that goes with that is that has spread over time in the state of Vermont. It has increased the amount of runoff and hydrological problems that increase stream bank erosion, which is another issue that we've seen expand over the history of the state caused by agricultural practice, forestry practices, development pressures, there's uh, development of wetlands and floodplains. All of those things have contributed to excessive spikes in the hydrograph, the amount of flow that hits our streams during rainfall events, exacerbated by climate change and the increased frequency and intensity of stormwater events. All of this is combining to send massive amounts of sediment 
over time into the lake in a slow moving catastrophe that's not showing any sign of reversing unless we really dramatically change the path. So, the history. Now we're getting to the history? <laughs> Some important things happened in the early 1990s in Vermont. There was uh, a recognition that things were falling apart. There was a, a big signing ceremony between Governor Cuomo and Governor Cunin the, of New York and Vermont, signed an agreement that they were gonna improve the quality of the lake. That led to a whole set of steps that took place over the course of the 90s. Um, there was some planning efforts, some investment in, in modeling work, scientific work, development of phosphorus standards. The 90s were important in that way. They're also important because there was a guy who graduated in 1991 from Vermont Law School who went on to become the single most significant advocate for clean water in the state of Vermont. This guy. <laughs> and that also is something to keep in mind as we talk about this because the role of the law and advocacy was a major part of what's gotten us to where we are in the history of the TMDL today. So what all that led to ultimately was the submission by the state of Vermont which took the lead, as it should, right? You find that the lake's impaired for phosphorus, the state is responsible for developing a TMDL and an implementation plan. State of Vermont did that. They submitted to the EPA in draft in 2001. Again, in 2002, EPA approved it in 2002, and the state was off on its way to implement that plan. Maybe not as quickly as some people wanted. In 2008, the Conservation Law Foundation filed a lawsuit against EPA challenging its approval of the TMDL. In 2010, EPA said, enough already, we give. They asked the federal judge to remand it back to them. They took it back, reconsidered it, and on January 24th of 2011, I was two weeks into the job, didn't even know where the pencil sharpener was, and I was handed a letter from Secretary Markowitz, who had been handed a letter from Stephen Perkins, that said, State of Vermont, sorry, we're disapproving your TMDL. The one you submitted in 2002 is no longer valid, and you missed your chance. We now are gonna do a TMDL for you. And at that point, my staff came to me and said, can you believe it? Those people, <laughs> that people at EPA have disapproved our, disallowed our TMDL, and the Attorney General's office sent an attorney over to give me all of the options on ways that we could sue EPA and stop them from overturning the TMDL. And Secretary Markowitz and I and the Governor and Secretary Ross and others sat down and said, that's not the way we want to do things. We want to be part of figuring out a constructive solution. So we spent the last four and a half, almost five years now working to develop a plan in consultation and coordination with EPA. That plan was issued in draft about a year ago. Um, in response to EPA's comments, it's been revised. The uh, EPA has issued, they had 90 days, by the way, from having made the decision to disapprove the TMDL to issue a new one. So they had, uh, they missed their deadline by about four years or so. Um, but they are on the verge now, uh, with any, any day now, uh, once they've reviewed all of the comments, the very helpful and constructive comments that they've been given, um, to turn that into a final TMDL, the state will then issue its implementation plan and will be off and running. Thank you for that brief statement, Professor Mears. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I'll remember this forever. Um, so the next next step, Steve, could you please uh, show us what we're, what we're really talking about here in visual? Yeah, just a few quick visuals and I'll, I'll bail David out on time here. So here's the watershed that he described for you. Now you get to see it visually. Uh, for those of you who are not from these parts, this lake flows from the south to the north. Um, and as David described, it's pretty riverine down in the southern part. Gets big in the middle, what most people refer to as the main lake. And then there are a lot of small embayments up in the northeast where there are particular problems. The color coding you see here, that green is all forest. Um, the yellowish is, or light green, is all agriculture. Um, there are very few sort of bright red spots, which is where there's urbanized areas. Um, so we're dealing with a big, um, non-point source dominated watershed. And here's how that looks in water quality context. The lake is broken into 13 segments. Vermont has all or part of 12 of those segments. And there are water quality standards or criteria for phosphorus that are set for each one of those segments. Um, they are different from one to another. 
and range from a high of 54 micrograms per liter uh, to a low of 10, a tough, <coughs> tough standard of 10 in the main lake. And here's a graphic representation of the problem. The, the black bars on this side is where the, the phosphorus criteria is set. Um, all those red bars are in segments of the lake that are exceeding the criteria. The blue ones are, are meeting it or just meeting it um, in the central part of the lake. So we had a big challenge and all of these segments interact. You wouldn't be surprised to know that between the flow from south to north and the basic sloshing in the lake that these segments cannot be dealt with in isolation. Um, but we have to meet different standards in different segments of the lake. Um, so Pat scooped me with a picture of Mrs. Goy Bay earlier today, uh, but this was an, a, a beautiful August day on Mrs. Goy Bay, a picture taken by some researchers from UVM. That white stuff you see is not a boat wake. Um, that's, that's decaying or dyed uh, you know, cells from, from after an algal bloom. Uh, so there's no boat wake in that picture. Um, but that's what, it's this kind of thing that motivates people like me and it's certainly everybody on this panel and many people throughout Vermont to get something done here. So here's the challenge. The pie on the top is the base load. This, was, this is a calculation over the period of 2000 to 2010, and it's divided up here into the major segments uh, that, that discharge into the lake, agriculture being the biggest one uh, on, on the right side. And if I keep going around, it's the next part of the pie is the forest, then the red is the developed lands, wastewater treatment facilities of that little gray slice, and erosion of unstable stream corridors is the, the portion in the upper left. Um, the challenge here is we need to shrink it down to the pie that you see on the lower half of the page. An overall 34% reduction when you look at the lake in total, uh, but when you break it down on a segment by segment basis, it's, it, it ranges from maybe a 10% reduction in some areas to as much as a 60% reduction in some other segments. So this is where the fun starts, when we get the, the small pie down below and have to figure out how on earth are we going to get there. Thank you. It's been a big day for agriculture. Um, and it's interesting, in the administration, you are agriculture separate from environment and natural resources like it is in many places. Um, how key is your relationship, or has your relationship been in coming to the TMDL, uh, new, essentially the new policy that you're going to be implementing, and how important is that working relationship going forward? In some ways, it's also a political will question. To whom are you asking? Whoever wants to jump on that, but since Professor Mears already spoken, perhaps one of you can <laughs> talk. <laughs> um, I'll take it bit of a stab and I'll let my colleague to my right and to my left also add. Um, I would say the ability to work across agencies has been critical. Um, and I tell the story as I've told it many times before. The first professional phone call I had um, was a phone call I had with uh, Deb Markowitz and David Mears. David was still enjoying himself in China at the time, um, claiming he's going to come back to Vermont and do some work which he eventually did, but, um, but the conversation really was um, about this problem. Um, we saw it um, as we walked in the door, and um, my recollection is um, a conversation that went along the lines of, we probably got about three and a half, four years to figure this out, and then we're going to have to start paying the bill. And I'm not sure where that's going to come from, but it's going to be big, and it's going to be important that we get the work done. And from that moment on, uh, Deb and David um, and myself and many others in state government and our agencies and beyond have worked closely together to um, figure out how to advance public policy, um, bring partnerships not only inside state government and outside state government into the conversation to develop a plan that we could uh, um, capitalize in the way of legislation and operationalize in the way of implementation. And uh, had we not had that working in um, esprit de corps, it uh, would have been incredibly difficult. And I will tell you that uh, that esprit de corps across the agencies was not something that you see in all um, state governments. And quite frankly, um, I would suggest it wasn't even um, as good as it should have been before we arrived. It's one of the things I'm most proud of um, as a uh, state employee 
is my ability um, to work with a bunch of people that heretofore had been at odds with each other oftentimes and have actually found a way to work together for the betterment of the uh, whole state. Uh, so uh, let me add in, I, I just want to tell folks here um, who may not know it, how lucky we are that Chuck Ross is the secretary at this time. And, you know, when, when this first came to our plate, you know, as David recalls, you know, it's, it, it, we didn't choose to deal with water quality in this administration. We hadn't even gotten a chance to take a deep breath yet to say, okay, what, you know, of all the things we want to do, what do we want to get accomplished? Um, it fell on our plates, and we had a choice to fight or to fix. And, you know, we're a new administration made up of environmentalists. We are going to fix. But this is a problem um, that was plagued with a historic division in our state and across the country, which is that each of the sectors uh, became very adept at pointing the finger at each other. And of course, they're all right. You know, farmers point at, at the built environment and said, hey, look, it's them. And, and the built environment folks point at the, the community saying, no, it's the local roads. And everyone can point at each other. And in fact, we had this history of, of a lot of finger pointing. And so we were really lucky to have Chuck at this time because he came out of Leahy's office, where Leahy's number one issue was Lake Champlain, this love for Lake Champlain. So he came as a dairy farmer, um, so he's tremendous uh, credibility with the farming community, but also is a very strong environmentalist. And we could not have done it without him. I have to say, you know, as Steve thinks about rolling out TMDLs in other states, and as I talk to colleagues about the challenges, uh, similar challenges they're facing dealing with precipitation driven runoff, you know, I was actually just with my colleagues from Ohio yesterday talking about this very issue. Um, having somebody credible with the farming community is, inc is incredibly important. And that's because one of the things that those of us who haven't been uh, raised on farms don't understand is that there's this history of the government coming in saying, we know how to do it better than you, follow our practices, and then the farmer ends up paying the price when that advice is wrong, right? So, and we're seeing a little bit of that here. You know, all the liquid manure pits, they're not doing it because they figure that was a good thing to do. It's because the government experts said, this is what you do to manage nutrients. And now we find that was actually probably a mistake. So just to, you know, back to this, you know, lay of the land piece, having somebody credible with agriculture willing to come to the table and make some really tough uh, choices uh, was essential and to our success. If I could just add one piece of this, too, and not to take anything away from you, Secretary Ross, um, but I think <laughs> Secretary Ross was blessed also by some really strong leaders in the agricultural community in the state of Vermont. And one of the things, for those of you who are not from the state, it's a small state, it's the, it's the second smallest state, we're 600,000 people or so, and uh, the farmers were hearing it from their neighbors at the post office, at the grocery store, and they had their own relationship with the lake and the systems and their own concerns. And mostly what they wanted from us as state officials was straight talk and the ability to have input. They were willing to accept regulations. In fact, they did have a positive agenda, whether the national group does or doesn't. Um, the state of Vermont farm community really did have a positive agenda and it was to work with us to help develop better regulations. And so while they may or may not be regulations that go far enough, there's a still a great conversation to be had about whether um, the state will get that right. Um, there's no question that the farm community is a partner in that. And so that created space for Secretary Ross to do something I think few other secretaries of agriculture or secretaries of natural resources around the country have been able to do. I was actually going to turn to you because we've heard from them. Can you talk a little bit about your role, the role of CLF in this process? Uh, I can. I'd like to pick up on the last sure. and then discussion you... a bit. Um, and maybe that will capture mm -hmm. some of what you're, you're getting at. Um, and, and the last uh, conversation was about partnerships. Um, and I want to frame that, uh, uh, reframe that may, maybe a bit about um, accountability or fair share. Um, and in the context of the, the dialogue we've been having today, I guess I would talk about it through the lens of what is uh, now referred to as reasonable assurance. This concept that where you have a watershed like Lake Champlain, where you have uh, sources across many categories, some of which are um, sort of generically referred to as, as non-point sources, although from our perspective, many of them are actually 
point sources. Um, uh, in order to approve a TMDL, EPA needs to find uh, that there are reasonable assurances provided that um, the non-point sources will in fact bear their fair share of the load. Um, we also believe there's a, a, a temporal component to that, um, not that they'll bear their fair share of the load over the next 200 years or 50 years or 30 years, but, but near term, uh, so that water quality standards can be met. Uh, at the soonest, uh, at the earliest possible time. This concept of reasonable assurance uh, was created by EPA. Uh, this is very important for people to remember. Um, as a basis for allowing less stringent controls on point sources than would otherwise be required under the water quality based effluent limitation provisions of the Clean Water Act. It was created um, not to um, crack down on non-point sources, but rather to figure out a way to say to point source dischargers that were coming in to get permits, that they could get a permit even though the receiving water body would still be nowhere near meeting water quality standards and they wouldn't be required to go to zero for whatever pollutant of concern was, was at issue. Um, and uh, I, I want to just clarify that with regard to the 2002 TMDL, my organization filed extensive comments pointing out to US EPA that there were, was absolutely no basis from our perspective for reasonable assurances at the time that that TMDL was approved by EPA. Um, and uh, whether this uh, can be considered some sort of uh, vindication or not, I guess is, is somewhat irrelevant at this point, but um, after the, the EPA approved that document uh, in, in 2002, we commenced a campaign. We filed a lawsuit in, 19, in 2008 on the last day of the statute of limitations because we spent all of the intervening time trying to persuade the state of Vermont at every level, including the legislature and US EPA, that they had made a terrible mistake and that as a last resort, we would um, uh, file suit. Uh, we even passed a law uh, that, la that had uh, a future effective date, one year from the date of its passage, that required the TMDL to be rewritten for the Vermont portion uh, it lasted about three weeks into the adjourned session of the, of the legislature before it was repealed the next year, so it never went into effect. So we, we filed suit as a last resort. We negotiated with EPA. When EPA ultimately issued its uh, disapproval letter, it wrote that it was unable to identify any programs or activity in, existent, in existence at the time of the TMDL submittal that provided assurance that non-point source reductions would occur no programs or activities, and that anticipated reductions would be sufficient to meet the TMDL load allocation. So, and we had one particular, I have a fly bothering me here, sorry. We had one particular uh, uh, ally in the passage of time. Uh, essentially, the uh, projected load reductions from agriculture and from other non-point sources uh, were proven wrong by the passage of time. Nothing along the lines of what was anticipated in the TMDL, uh, the 2002 TMDL was in fact happening. Um, in addition to that, uh, after the 2002 TMDL was issued, because reasonable assurances are all about issuing permits to point source dischargers that are uh, less stringent than the law would otherwise require, uh, the DEC at that time had commenced issuing permits to wastewater treatment plants on a path to allowing those wastewater treatment uh, plants to expand their discharge of phosphorus by 30 metric tons of phosphorus per year into the lake. So we litigated numerous cases. We challenged every permit, basically trying to hold the line by saying, this is crazy, the non-point source reductions are not occurring, they, there isn't even a program that was identified by which they could occur, and you are allowing and permitting wastewater treatment plants to uh, expand their discharge of phosphorus into this terribly polluted lake. Um, so uh, 
Ultimately, that's what led to EPA, uh, I think, and Stephen can speak to this, reaching the conclusion that it did on reasonable assurances. We now have a new DMDL draft. I appreciate that my colleagues have been speaking in the past tense. It's a draft. It is not final. Uh, the comment period just closed. Uh, we and Vermont Natural Resources Council filed extensive, and others filed extensive comments. We have grave concerns about the reasonable assurances moving forward that we wanted to note for the record. Um, so getting back to the, to the core point, partnerships or accountability, reasonable assurances are the name of the game in this TMDL. It is absolutely necessary that we see programs for agriculture and any other non-point source. Um, we don't consider state highways or municipal roads or big parking lots to be non-point sources, although they've been inappropriately put in the load allocation in the draft TMDL. Um, but that partnership or accountability, we hear from farmers time and again, and Chuck is, is, is our most trusted ally in this regard, and we've reached, uh, made great strides working with this administration, that they are the greatest defenders of water quality. They, they want to do the right thing. And to the extent there's a problem from agriculture, whether conventional ag or uh, uh, you know, uh, smaller uh, activities that are not necessarily within the conventional dairy framework, they want to do the right thing. Um, we need programs that take them up on that, that assure that we have accountability and that we have a partnership that means something and that um, holds those uh, actors in any sector accountable who don't want to play the game, who don't want to participate. We hear it uh, from farmers time and again. They want to do the right thing. They are doing the right thing and there's a few bad apples. Well. Let's set up some metrics that actually demonstrate that so the public has some assurance and EPA can make its reasonable assurance determination. And then let's hold those uh, bad actors, to the extent we want to characterize them that way, accountable to a mandatory program. So it is about partnerships. Chuck has been a valued um, collaborator. Uh, we've gone through a very interesting and long negotiation that we could get into more detail about if folks are interested in. Uh, and there's a program on the table that we think actually goes, um, if implemented, will provide reasonable assurances in, the, in some of the watersheds most affected by agriculture. Let's talk about the implementation part and kind of more of the details to the extent you have them at this point on the different sectors that really have to contribute, especially agriculture. So clearly, it's the it is the largest source, and and this is an issue, as you noted, Secretary Berkowitz, around the country. I mean, this is something that we face uh, um, with water quality. So, can you can you tell us? Are you at liberty? Can you tell us any any anything you proposed, and and how will the in in, in furtherance of that? What is the federal uh, state interface? Because as many of us know, much funding comes through the Farm Bill for conservation practices. Well, I'd like to tell you, I'm going to give you the secret that I haven't told anybody else about how we're going to solve this problem. But um, quite frankly, everything we, I can tell you about is stuff we've discussed publicly, which I think is actually um, uh, uh, an attribute and a, and a tribute to Vermonters um, and to the conversation we've had here. And in fact, the um, settlement, a draft settlement agreement that uh, uh, the Conservation Law Foundation and the Agency of Agriculture um, have reached as a, a tentative um, agreement subject to further public input um, is on our web. If you want to read it, you can read it. And you can see what it is that um, Chris Kelly and Chuck Ross and, and uh, people from our respective um, organizations uh, discussed for months um, and came to a place where we think we actually have something. Um, I want to make one prefatory comment and then I'll more directly answer your question. Um, I too, like Deb and, and David, and he was in his position, we meet with our colleagues around the country. Um, and this issue, as bad as it is, and particularly as nasty as it is in some bodies of water in the state of Vermont, is not isolated to the state of Vermont. This is an issue of profound, um, problematic uh, foundation across the country. Um, the hypoxia zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River is the size of Delaware. 
That's the area where you are unlikely to be able to successfully fish, and people used to have, you know, ex exercise a living out of that part of the Gulf um, because it was so polluted. Um, and it reaches via the Missouri and most importantly the Mississippi up into the heart of our country, the heart of what we consider um, the ag world, a really big agricultural area in, this, in the United States. But it's not isolated to that part of the United States either. It is a fundamental problem across the country. It's a non-point problem, and I would submit to you it requires the same approach that we used on the point source pol pollution issues of the 1960s. It is a national problem, and it requires a national approach and a national response if we're going to do it as well as we need to. I've said that publicly. I've said it to the um, administrators of the USDA, and I feel firm, very strongly about this. Um, because it's so significant, not only to us, but elsewhere. So what we've done in the state of Vermont, um, we have uh, tried to figure out a way to um, develop public policy that reflects the conversations that have um, that led to the TMDL plan, which you can read. Um, uh, this composed of the plan in phase one and phase two, phase two impl implementation components. And um, for us in agriculture, that means we've uh, been approved to hire some additional resources to address the um, challenges we have inspecting and understanding what needs to be done on the farms in the state of Vermont. To give you some sense of how we got here, when I came into the agency, we had four staff people and 7,000 farms, over 7,000 farms as measured by the USDA. And we had four staff people to make sure they were complying with the Clean Water Act and the regulations of the state of Vermont. Surprise, surprise, surprise. We have a problem on our hands, and not everybody even knew the baseline regulatory requirements for agriculture called the AAPs. So we've gotten staff, we've been authorized to hire some staff. I will submit to you right now, it's questionable at this juncture whether there's going to be enough staff, but it's certainly more than we had and to reach out and to first and foremost educate the farmers about what's expected of them, help them identify what problems they might have with their farm, to help them develop a plan that um, uh, what they need to do to address the issues on their farm, get in line um, with uh, uh, in line for the resources that may be available to help them, and then when those resources are available, assuming they're not egregious problems, implement those changes. Oh, by the way, I just outlined the fundamental, fundamental agreement that uh, the Conservation Law Foundation and the Agency of Agriculture have submitted uh, for public um, uh, input. That's what we're proposing to do. In addition to that, we're going to take what formerly known as the ag accepted agricultural practices. That's the baseline performance standards that you have to meet if you're going to operate a farm, and we're elevating them according to some requirements and in state law that was passed it's called in the law that's now called Act 64, the Clean Water Act that was negotiated by all of us up here in some in one way, shape, or form. And we're elevating that performance and we're rewriting them and they're gonna now be called the required agricultural practices. And they're aimed to a large degree at improving the um, on-farm, in the field uh, practices uh, incorporate conservation practices uh, required of those farmers in order to meet the baseline um, performance requirements set forth in those uh, uh, that what will be a new set of regulations. Um, in addition, we've um, to go to the accountability issue um, that uh, Chris touched on. We've got a whole a number of new enforcement mechanisms that we can um, employ if needed. I will tell you from my perspective, by the time you get ready to employ enforcement mechanisms, you've already failed. Um, what we need to do, and what is most fundamental, is we need to get people to understand what they need to do. Um, and uh, my experience is with many, not all, but many farmers and many and not all Vermonters is they will try to do the right thing if they know what it is they're supposed to do but we need to help them understand what it is they need to do. And so the regulatory framework that we put in place, the laws we put in place, um, I'll tell you in my mind are necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're necessary because we have to have that baseline. We have to have a clear expectation.
But what's not sufficient is that all of you don't already know what you need to be doing. Because this is going to require all of us in, and it's going to require a culture change around water quality in the state of Vermont like we have not seen before. If we're actually going to get to the point where we're going to take that huge ecosystem that David touched on and give it a sufficient break in terms of the inputs put into it so that it can restore itself. That's going to require culture change, not just regulation and laws. Please stand. Secretary Ross, if I, uh, just to compliment a little bit, can, to take a slightly deeper dive into some of what the plan requires with regard to agriculture and what the Vermont Clean Water Act requires and obligates Secretary Ross and his team and um, I was about to say my team. My former team, I'm looking at Marley, Roop, and um, Gary Kessler back there who are very engaged in agricultural regulatory work for the Department of Environmental Conservation. But there's a set of, basically, when you did the, uh, the work of protecting water quality involved, uh, whether it's stormwater or farming, is not rocket science. It's not like sending someone to the moon. It's, for the most part, pretty straightforward. I don't mean it's cheap or that it's necessarily easy, but it's not complicated. So in the case of farms, you want to keep the soil on the farm that's good for the farmer, it's good for the crops, it's, it's good all around to keep the soil on the farm. And to keep the nutrients in the soil, those are the basic things that you want to do. And you can do that through cover cropping, you can do it through better um, use of riparian buffers, you can do it by keeping the cows off of the, and, and you know, animals off of the stream banks. There's a set of things that are pretty straightforward. Um, that need to just be implemented. And so what the Agency of Agriculture is in the process of doing is kind of putting into, um, into regulatory form increased and enhanced requirements in that regard. There have been years in which we've kind of focused on, um, to some, some good effect, the, the, the feedlot operations, the production areas, you know, where the, the cows congregate and the, the, the soil's trampled and there's lots of manure to be managed. That becomes relatively straightforward, but we were ignoring the fact that there were large amounts of nutrients being spread across these fields that were just in Vermont at least, when the corn had been cleared, and it was in the fall or the spring, and there was a lot of bare soil, you're applying manure, also happens to be very wet periods of time in the state. Those are times at which, you know, the crop practices and the, the methods of dealing with your fields are critical, and so there's a whole set of requirements that are intended to try to get after that in a more effective way. I was just going to tick off some of those things. I was avoiding the detail, but the, to the degree that detail matters. Detail's good. Buff, <laughs> buffer strips are increased. Um, uh, livestock um, exclusion, so you can't have livestock in the streams. Uh, contour plowing, uh, manure injection, uh, cover cropping, um, uh, Gully erosion um, or seeding um, the gullies so they are not actually plowed up but they're seeded down to a permanent side. Um, barnyard repair and maintenance. Um, most of these are things that the NRCS would consider conservation practices, correct? And would most of them would be. Equip? Can, and and e they're all, all part of what used to be called the Green Farm Bill, the EQIP package. Um, and there's. And, what we were able to do in the state of Vermont, Deb and David were both in, uh, instrumental in, is we were able to obtain a bunch of federal resources to bring to the table, as well as um, some significant increases in state resources to, to help implement not only agricultural um, practices, but also, also practices for other things that Deb and, uh, can probably speak to better than I. But those are some of the specific conservation practices that um, <laughs> Uh, we will be implementing and be requiring um, farmers to implement on their farms. So I just wanted to add a couple right. things sure. to it. Um, an overlay to the regulatory frame that, that Chuck and folks in my office are looking at, we're also partnering with the conservation community. And, uh, and that's because there's a recognition that, you know, in Vermont, we, we do a lot of great and important land conservation. A lot of farms are conserved. When they're conserved, uh, they're not necessarily held to these best practices. In fact, we try to convince them to, to do the equip and we'll give them a little extra money, but they, but they don't always have to. And so uh, both Chuck and I serve on the board of the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and, uh, and we've been revising these conservation standards so they align, with, better align with, uh, with these clean water goals. In addition, working with other partners uh, 
the Vermont Land Trust, the uh, Nature Conservancy, we're looking at whether or not there's targeted buyouts that may make sense. Because we already know, we know instinctively, that we've got some farms that are probably just in the wrong place. That you just aren't going to be able to have livestock on these places based on, because of the historic use of that property and the amounts of nutrients in the soils and, and because of the, the, uh, the hydrology, you know, where, where it's sitting. Um, in the watershed. And so there really is an all-on-board approach. I also wanted to make a point. Uh, you, you noted in the beginning that farming is the big problem, but, but in fact, I wish we had the, uh, the pie charts like this across the watershed. And you'll see that depending on where you are in the watershed, it may not be the biggest driver of pollution. There are places where it's the developed lands um, that, that are really uh, the problem. And so there needs to be an equal, uh, aggressive approach on how we're dealing with stormwater management across the landscape, whether it's roads or existing development, new development. So it's a good point. But it, it is true that across the country, the leading source of non-point source pollution is agriculture. And, and I do think, to your point, though, what you're really talking about is taking a systems approach and using a bunch of different strategies, maximizing them, which, which is, I think, necessary across the country. And I think that partnership with NRCS and those federal dollars, which are so key, it's really our biggest source of dollars to get some of this done. And I know you all have a very good relationship with your state conservationist. Chris, do you want to say something? I, well, I wanted to pick up on the last point that Secretary Markowitz was, was just making. Um, <clears throat> and um, again, Partnerships are important, public funding, uh, going to Professor Houck's uh, comments earlier, uh, to, to some extent characterized as paying people to not pollute, has to be uh, juxtaposed with accountability in industries where there is a, uh, a profit motive and with permittees that are required to comply with the Clean Water Act. Um, and it is true that really outside of uh, three areas, uh, specific areas of Lake Champlain, developed land is the large, largest source category. In fact, and on a per acre basis, pavement is contributing more phosphorus than agriculture on a per acre basis everywhere in the watershed. And this is a watershed on the Vermont side, like many places in the country, that is rapidly being consumed by development. Uh, obviously big uh, public policy questions associated with land use uh, there, but for purposes of reasonable assurances in the Clean Water Act, um, we have some other uh, uh, concerns. Um, in the draft that has been of the TMDL that's been put forward, the industry that has cut uh, the biggest break uh, in the allocations is the commercial real estate industry. Um, we think that the plan thus far is out of balance in not requiring the owners of existing paved surfaces to do their fair share. It's a relatively small percentage of the cleanup obligation, um, and it's not fair, and it's not going to work. Um, so things like residual designation authority under uh, Section 402P of the Clean Water Act, where those sources are supposed to be required to obtain permits that clean their sites up, including um, phosphorus-targeted effluent limitations in those permits, which has never occurred once to date in the state of Vermont. We don't have a single phosphorus-based permit limit in a stormwater permit in the state of Vermont at all. Those things have to change. Um, and so I just want to make sure, I think, um, uh, what Chuck and the Agency of Ag have done, the productive conversations we've had, the commitments we've heard from agriculture, certainly in the areas of the Lake Missisquoi Bay, uh, St. Albans Bay, the South Lake, Otter Creek segment. I commend the Secretary and um, the agricultural community for coming forward with the kind of commitment they've expressed and the programs we've been able to uh, negotiate with them, and I'm hopeful that we're moving in the right direction. Um, granted, there was a legal, <laughs> a legal context for some of those discussions, which was not entirely comfortable for everyone all the time, uh, but we got there, and, and I, I, I think that's a really powerful, positive message. The same has not been true with the commercial real estate industry. I think the commercial real estate industry in this state and across the country is enjoying uh, 
a loophole in the Clean Water Act. It is not an exemption. Uh, Section 402 P6 uh, that talks about uh, those dischargers not needing to obtain a permit for existing paved surfaces unless it is determined through an administrative action that they are causing or contributing to a water quality standards violation in agencies like EPA and Vermont DEC and others uh, having to be brought along to make any of those determinations. There have been very few made and thus this industry is sitting on the sidelines and profiting <laughs> extensively from their ability to dump pollution into the nation's waters and into Lake Champlain uh, here, that has to change. Uh, and what the TMBL currently sets forth um, in the first instance, very limited use of RDA or other tools to bring retrofits to those existing parking lots and retaining authority that should be exercised now uh, for accountability later is the wrong way to go. We need to see a uh, dramatic shift in order for this TMDL to be approved in um, reductions from that source category. And remember, all of this, again, with the new TMDL, just like 2002, is to use reasonable assurances to allow wastewater treatment facilities to expand their discharge of dissolved phosphorus into Lake Champlain. Not five years from now, not 10 years from now, as soon as they request a permit, which could be next year, and if, I, if this TMDL is approved, I'd be in next year. I want my piece of the pie. I want to expand to the greatest degree possible right now because it's going to cost me money to control. And that, I just don't see how in a lake like Lake Champlain, where we have the kind of foul conditions that are devaluing people's property and destroying that public resource, we can allow any wastewater treatment facility to expand its discharge of dissolved phosphorus, the most bioavailable, immediately um, uh, destructive form of phosphorus that can be discharged, uh, it just doesn't make sense. So people make pragmatic arguments about cost effectiveness, which I, I don't agree with. They make arguments about uh, realism and pragmatism and municipalities being stretched. Unfortunately, we're beyond that point, and honestly, the greatest gains we've made in litigating cases and requiring stringent permit limits for nutrients have been in the context where there's no TMDL, because we don't want a TMDL where there's a defense uh, to those kinds of controls in a wastewater treatment facility permit case or industrial permit case, because we've said that maybe 20, 30, 50 years down the road, we might meet water quality standards. Secretary Markland, should I respond? Yeah, sure, this is obviously a place where we differ. Um, and, you know, we won't put Stephen Perkins on the spot since, you know, they're, they're uh, taking, they're thinking about these comments as we speak. But uh, the, what, what we fought so hard for um, with this TMDL was the flexibility to get it right. And if you take a look at this pie chart, you'll see right now it's only about 4% of the pollution is coming out of those wastewater treatment facilities, looking at them as a whole. And uh, the cost of bringing them up to best available technology is hundreds of millions of dollars. That's a lot of money in the system. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's, we know that with 650,000 people in Vermont, there's finite resources. Uh, we, we really argued for a much more strategic approach. Let's take a look at where we can get the most bang for a buck, uh, make the, the greatest gains, and, uh, and then in those areas where it's less gains, you know, Clean Water Act still applies, let's, let's provide the kind of flexibility that would allow us to, uh, to roll out those, uh, those new technologies, the best available technologies over time in, in a way that, uh, that uh, is a better use of our money. It allows us to, to focus more of these dollars uh, in the non-point source, the precipitation-driven uh, pollution. Um, it, it, Chris also makes the point that uh, we should be going right away to retrofitting uh, the existing uh, impervious surface. And, and we took a different approach. We, we, we really think it makes sense and we'll be making gains by uh, issuing a new stormwater manual, which has uh, much more stringent requirements um, that applies to new developments. In addition, we've got uh, new MS4s that are going out and TS4s, those are the stormwater permits focused at, at municipalities and folks who are managing our roads, both in the state level and on the local level. And that by doing that, we'll ratchet down the pollution that's coming off of 
uh, our built areas um, and uh, make sure that we're slowing it down and, and allowing it to infiltrate rather than roll off the landscape and bring, uh, to bring more pollution into our waterways. Um, again, one of the beauties of this TMDL, this reasonable assurance, is that there's regular check-ins. And uh, we're going to be held to, to standards. The EPA is looking over our shoulders, and in, in five years they're going to say, okay, have you met the benchmarks? Uh, in 10 years, have you met the benchmarks? And to the extent that uh, Chris is right, and we're not achieving the kinds of goals that, that we're aiming to at that point, we can readjust and say, okay, when, you know, now it's time to, to uh, dig up existing pavement to change the way we're managing the water coming off of rooftops. We'll be doing some of that as well in targeted areas, but just not all across the watershed. The other thing I want to say is one of the beauties of this approach, the approach we're using in Vermont, and one of the things that I believe makes it unique across the country, is it comes out of our basin planning program. Uh, we've had this very robust approach of having uh, scientists on the ground looking across the basin at water quality standards and what's contributing to water quality uh, issues in the different areas of, of, uh, of the basin. And, and out of that, they come up with um, sort of a list of projects that, uh, that they believe will, will make a difference. Um, you know, every few years they're going to go back into the basin, do their scientific work uh, afresh, and we'll be able to readjust as we go on. In, we in 1991, there was a law passed that I sat in the cafeteria of the Vermont State House writing with uh, uh, now Representative David Dean that required all basin plans in the state of Vermont to be updated in five years. When that law passed, in uh, uh, that time frame passed in 1996, one basin plan had been updated. So we extended that date in another piece of legislation that I sat in the cafeteria and helped draft to 2004, I believe. And in that time, no basin plans were updated or adopted. This administration has been far more uh, forward thinking than some of the past administrations in the state of Vermont with regard to basin planning. But the basin plans we have now are vague and ambiguous and cannot be relied on for reasonable assurances. The two most straightforward regulatory program hooks that we have in the state of Vermont, the Residual Designation and Clean Water Act Stormwater Permitting Program, and point source permits for wastewater treatment plants, both of which we know are effective in controlling phosphorus, have been backburnered. And we've told municipalities that they have to retrofit 100% of their gravel road miles in order to meet this TMDL. You want to talk about cost? Um, it, that cost will dwarf upgrading wastewater treatment plants. And I, I have to tell you, this is the same discussion we had in 2002. And it took Chris, six years. Your comment, please? Sure, it took six years uh, to get to the lawsuit, and, and almost nine years to get to an ultimate outcome where we have a new TMDL being written. But I am terrified that this TMDL will once again serve as a process for exempting point sources from the water quality-based effluent limitation provisions of the Clean Water Act, and provide a valid legal defense in that regard. And it would be a terrible outcome, and I urge EPA to not adopt it. Okay, so uh, we, I really want to turn this over to the floor, because we have this unique opportunity, and, and the folks up here to really have a discussion with them about this issue. Um, but before we do, David, did you want to make any final comments? Um, and I'm, I'm, we haven't even heard from Stephen Park. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 he's actually ducking <laughs> under his desk. <laughs> I, I guess I would just add one thing, which is that I, I've, um, I have a slightly different terror that keeps me up at night when I think about the implementation, which is that really the, we know that the biggest gains to be had are in the areas of agriculture, the, the existing developed land and stormwater retrofits, um, and the road systems and stream bank erosion. Those are big, massive areas of challenge, and we have not historically had robust, meaningful regulatory programs. We're moving to implement those under the, 
uh, we, the state is now moving to implement those regulatory programs. That's a, it's a very big breakthrough, just for those of you who haven't been following this for the last 25 or 30 years, it's a big breakthrough that in the state of Vermont we have regulatory programs um, that are going to be driving down to, to smaller and smaller units in terms of dealing with local road pollution, agriculture, um, existing developed land, and dealing with stream bank erosion. Those are a big deal. What I'm not, what I'm worried about, frankly, is what happens in terms of the politics of the state. That if another administration comes in, and it's inevitable, right? That as you start to implement these regulatory programs, you start to bump into the <coughs> costs, and people start to push back and fight, and that plays out in the political arena. And because these were not driven specifically by the Federal Clean Water Act, but are essentially being driven by state legislation, they can be reversed. And that's my biggest fear, because we have a 20 plus year um, plan that needs to be implemented. It needs continuity, it needs continuous investment in order to be successful. We can't just have it change every two to six years and be able to maintain any kind of real success. If we're gonna persuade people like Chris Killian and the Conservation Law Foundation that this plan is anything more than a bunch of you know pieces of paper stapled together, it's because the state actually follows through on these regulatory programs. So we're off, I think, to a great start, but I do worry that we'll be able to sustain that commitment. Thank you. Steve, do you want to say, do you want to say anything? <laughs> Is he very, or do you want to remain quiet? <laughs> well, I would like to make one observation to sort of tie together some other things that we've heard today about how, how the numbers are important. Um, and so when we arrived sort of at the time when, we, when EPA determined how much smaller the pie needed to be, um, all of a sudden there were numbers, and that forced a robust discussion, some of which you're, you're hearing the history of and some of which you're seeing continues to play out today. Um, don't be fooled into thinking that when the numbers first come out, that they dictate that there's only one solution to reach those numbers. There are many ways to get there, and that's what this engagement was, was all about. And EPA was all about realizing that we didn't have a real practical way to make sure that this stuff got implemented on the ground, so it better have Vermonters' fingerprints all over it, or it was going to be truly a plan that was a bunch of pieces of paper stapled together and, and produced no meaningful result on the ground. And so we had a really fruitful engagement. We had tension along the way. There were, there were you know, marks that we wouldn't go past. We wouldn't, EPA wouldn't uh, entertain the notion of no changes at any of the wastewater treatment plants. That was a point of friction. There were other points like that. So there was give and take in the process, but it was, it was truly a partnership and it was driven by the framework and the numbers. So there's, there's still hope for this tired old framework, mm -hmm. um, but, we may, but we may be in a laboratory that's unrepresentative of what may happen in many other places in the country. That's a really good point. This is ex it's an extraordinary dialogue, and I think we should uh, acknowledge that. So I'd like to turn over to the, um, to the uh, audience. Is there a mic wandering around? Gentleman over there. Um, I have a question about how much of this process is spilling over into other watersheds in the state. Um, something I've just wondered without knowing the answer about the TMDL process is that it tends to make us zero in on particular watersheds. And I just wondered, is that helpful because it gives us laboratories for achieving things, or is it problematic because we then forget about everything else, or, or both? And I'm curious what your perspective is. Well, from, from my perspective, it's sort of trying to manage the politics around it, it was very important to have the conversation bleed into other watersheds. And that's because Vermonters broadly are going to be paying for this. And so, um, so we've, we've had to, in order to, to convince legislators from, from parts of Vermont that aren't in the watershed, we've had to convince, convince them that these uh, issues, the issues of uh, precipitation-driven pollution and its impact you know, on our waterways, are, are uh, not just Lake Champlain. At the same time, we're negotiating a TMDL. Um, uh, the, the nutrient at issue is nitrogen for the Connecticut River watershed. That's significant up in, in uh, northern Vermont. It's uh, Lake Memphremagog. Uh, so, so there are TMDLs that are happening everywhere. At the same time, we're hearing about uh, algae blooms in, in other lakes. Uh, some of them are in the same watershed, but they're not Champlain-based. So yes, this conversation um, is, has broadened, in my experience, that's been helpful with the politics, 
Um, and, and in fact, on the ground, I think it's also very real that now, because of our land use practices over time, we're going to see more and more impaired waterways, and getting ahead of it will, will be helpful. David? But just to build on that, and just for folks that aren't familiar with Vermont's geography, um, between the Long Island Sound watershed, I mean the Connecticut River watershed that feeds into Long Island Sound, the, the Lake Champlain watershed, the Lake Magog watershed, that's 99% of the land mass of Vermont. The other thing I would mention is that a lot of the requirements that the Department of Environmental Conservation is implementing and the Ag Agency of Agriculture are implementing, either by virtue of the TMDL through existing regulatory authority or as a result of the Vermont Clean Water Act that passed last spring, are statewide programs. So they're being implemented in a phased way where we're starting in the, the Lake Champlain watershed because that's the most imminent and urgent set of needs. But the transportation permitting programs are statewide. The agricultural regulatory practices are statewide. Um, the stormwater requirements are statewide. So how we implement those and in which order, um, we can't do them all at once. But um, it, is, it is influencing the state of Vermont. It's basically setting a, a baseline against the rest of the state needing to meet. I do expect, however, that the Lake Champlain watershed and within it the sub-watersheds like Missiscoy Bay and the South Lake, which are the, the portions, as we've heard, that are shallower, warmer, and more prone, uh, more subject to this, the erosion from forestry and farm practices, that there's going to be e extra, a lot of extra work that the, the farm and foresters and um, communities in those parts of the lake are going to have to do that other parts of the state are not going to have to, to meet. Any other questions? Um, quick, quick comment and a question tied to it. I think that uh, I really like the idea of the reasonable assurances in the TMDL tied to the exercise of the residual authority to call things point source rather than non-point source. Uh, it drives me crazy when the uh, well-intentioned people in my state regulatory agency in Washington State want to call this problem non-point source. I'm look here, here. Here, these are all pipes that drives me crazy. And I'm wondering to what extent that, um, it just seems like leaving stuff at the, on, the, on the table at the beginning of your negotiation, to what extent has the state exercised the residual authority and, and regulated these things above the bare minimum that the Clean Water Act says have to be stormwater point sources subject to permitting requirements? Does the state want to answer that? I can address it. Chris is actually the best person to kind of talk about what we've done in that regard, but I'm glad to add to it. Uh, well, so uh, up until early 2000s, the state, like all, almost all other states, had not exercised residual designation authority at all. My organization filed a petition dealing with five watersheds surrounding Burlington, uh, some of the most intensely development, developed, I don't know what's up with this fly, but um, <laughs> intensely developed. Deb, did you send him down here? <laughs> he he blames um, me for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the most intensely developed watersheds in the state, and after a eight-year litigation battle with two trips to the Supreme Court, we finally obtained a ruling that all existing impervious uh, surface sources, commercial, industrial sources in those watersheds required permits because they were contributing to standards violation. In the Vermont Clean Water Act this past winter, we made a hallway deal with um, the administration that sources with three acres or greater of impervious uh, would be subject to a new permitting program requiring retrofit, and that has specific dates for rollout and definition. That was a political compromise. Uh, we had a petition pending at the time seeking to address all sources in the Lake Champlain watershed because phosphorus comes off all of that existing infrastructure and is contributing to the problem. So from our perspective, the legal standard is met. One of the issues that we are concerned about is that in the accountability framework context that EPA has been now developing in various watersheds, including here, uh, EPA is um, uh, sort of holding that club and saying, we could require people to get permits down the road if necessary, if all these other great programs don't pan out. And we think that that authority sh needs to be exercised now. It, those sources should be in the wa waste load allocation. We know they're contributing. They're 
the largest for-profit entities contributing to the problem. They're making money by pouring their, their pollution into the people's waters. They should be required to get permits and clean up, give them 10 years. But uh, I've heard, I sat in a room with one of the largest convenience store owners in New England two weeks ago who happens to own property on a badly polluted waterway and is trying to figure out if he can retrofit his own facilities because he cares all of a sudden because his grandkids can't swim. Um, and he said, well, you know, the way it's been is, uh, you know, if nobody else is required to do it, I'm not going to do it. But hey, you know, if they put a program in place, we all just figure out how to comply with it. You know, we might fight it for a while, but I just don't want to do it if nobody else has to do with it. Do it. And that's the problem with stormwater right now. We're ratcheting down on municipalities, which is appropriate. We're making rate bases pay, but we have a huge percentage of the problem coming from Walmarts and they aren't required to do anything. And that's just not fair. And it's as a result of political wheeling and dealing and leveraging that's occurred over time that has not defined them as non-point sources. EPA has a term that they use regularly now, non-NIPTES regulated point source. They originated it in the Eagleville Brook TMDL in Stores, Connecticut. And now it's being propagated. And it's absolutely shocking to me. Um, if you're a point source, you need a permit, and EPA is withholding this authority as our states and our waters are suffering. So we'd much rather see aggressive action in that regard. David? I, it's just stepping back a little bit from the Clean Water Act terminology and framework and just talking about some of the public policy issues that are embedded in this. First of all, as at a technical matter, again, same as I described for agriculture, the, the challenge of managing stormwater in existing developed areas is also not rocket science. It's not cheap or inexpensive, but it's basically finding ways to make sure that there are places for the stormwater to infiltrate into the ground. That's, fundamentally, that's what it's about. It's to slow it down, allow it to infiltrate. That's the best and ideal treatment. And to the extent that you can do that well, you'll actually get fairly good rates of, of nutrient removal, at least for phosphorus, maybe not so much for nitrogen. Um, there's certainly plenty of stormwater management methods that are, are kind of more structural and less effective at removing phosphorus. And one of the things the state's in the middle of is shifting its practices to require more of the kinds of infiltration practices that remove phosphorus. And that's, that's a technical discussion and an important one. But there's also a, another um, issue. So if you're, you know, pick, imagine, you know, an urban developed area where you've got a lot of uh, b businesses all together. Um, if each one of those businesses has to retrofit their own piece of property individually, um, it may be a lot more expensive than, for them to do it than if they banded together and they had more area and more space to work with. And so there's a public policy challenge about how do you create the right incentives and motivations for that to happen. One way is residual designation authority. If each of those entities fear that they're going to have to get their own permit and pay for it themselves, and then you create an opportunity for them to opt in to some kind of collective action, that may be a great way to drive them. Another way, and this goes to another set of... That's also called, called joint and several liability. <laughs> and there's also, uh, so there's, there's definitely accountability and mechanisms of the Clean Water Act, but there's this, just a policy choice, I think, for regulators um, and agencies to think about in that regard. There's another issue which, which is hard to talk about um, in the political context uh, you know, of any state, including Vermont, which is that a lot of this has to do with some really bad judgments that municipalities have made around land use, looking at John Echevarria um, and blaming him. Because he's the one who taught um, all of our land use lawyers in the state. <laughs> we, we have this John's fault. We have some communities making really bad judgments and decisions about land use. And so there's also a, a, a role to play to get communities to be, municipalities to be held responsible for managing stormwater. And that's at the essence of one of the policy decisions the state has made to expand the number of communities that are required to get what are called MS4 or MS4-like permits that will require the communities to come up with their own plans for figuring out how they're going to work with their developed community to address that. And they, they can do it through a broad-based rate structure or they can make each of the developers pay. There's, so there's some interesting and challenging policy issues that are embedded underneath some of this dialogue around the Clean Water Act terminology. Question? Yeah, a question for Secretary Ross, John Mueller. 
um, at first an observation and then a question. The observation is I just wanted to say that uh, hats off to you for uh, the way you've uh, approached this. You know, it's very refreshing to hear somebody in your position speak in, in terms that recognize agriculture's um, that part of the problem and wants to do something about it. And uh, my question is, how can we uh, bring your way of thinking to the Bay Region? Mm -hmm. Because when we talk to people in your position in any of the Bay States, we get a lot of pushback, a lot of basic lockstep conversation that we hear from the Farm Bureau. So I, I don't want to be your psychiatrist here, but I really want to understand <laughs> how you got there. I could use a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, well, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of comments. Um, I had the benefit of being the son of a father who grew up in Lake Champlain, who grew me up on Lake Champlain, and I've seen it change in 50 years. 60 years, actually, to be truthful. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's nothing like that to help you understand um, the significance. Um, I grew up the, my, the knee of my father, he was a Republican environmentalist. Um, and, um, and then I had my own experiences. Um, the other is that Vermont was making the same mistake everybody else was making. And I'm gonna give this administration the credit. We were making the same mistake everybody else was making and it was doing this. It's your fault. And as soon as you do that, you take the monkey off your back and you put it on somebody else's. And you've taken a step back from being a member of your community and you've protected your own interest. And we've had a, and I just wrote down this line, not anticipating what you said. We've got a history of ignorance being exploited by the profit motive. Um, and those two things, um, I submit to you, is the mistake that's made elsewhere is when you let your community stand in a circle and point at each other and claim that they're, that you are the problem and therefore I'm less of the problem, you get the monkey off your back and you don't get to the place where you have to stand together and recognize you're all at fault. Because guess what? There's not a one of you, not a one of you today in this room and your parents and their parents before them are, that are not at fault for the problems we have in this country. And you may be at fault through your own ignorance, but guess what, you're still part of the problem. And until you own that, you can't really step up and be part of the solution, can you? And what this administration did, in my view, with, like David mentioned, some really inspiring leaders in our communities, agriculture and beyond, is we had people stand up and say, we are part of the problem. We own it and we feel a responsibility to do something about it, and we will. And when that happens, the circle disintegrates and people stand in line and work together. Let me just add a couple words to that. Um, the measure, how I have measured success on this effort, is that in the legislative process and out of the governor's mouth, when, when, when Vermont leaders were talking about the Clean Water Act, um, we were saying we need to do this for us, not we're, we need to do this because Big Bad EPA is making us do that. And that was remarkable because politically it's very easy to hide behind EPA. You know, that's the safe thing to do. And, and the watershed moment in our campaign to get this law passed was when a conservative editor from the northern part of the state um, it, it happens to be in the area of the state that, that's really being ec economically uh, impacted by the algae blooms. Um, he wanted to organize a day at the state house. And it was like, oh my gosh, it's, you know, he's a very, um, pers you know, he's, he's an opinion leader in Vermont. He wanted to organize a day in the state house hearing from not the usual suspects. And he brought in uh, business owners, he brought in uh, farmers, he brought in, you know, across the sector, he brought in people saying, hey, we're all in. We have to solve this because otherwise we're gonna we're gonna bankrupt ourselves. We're gonna kill businesses. People can't sell their homes on the lake. It's it's killing our communities. And that was huge. This all in, and that became our mantra. 
you know, that we are all in. And my fear is that, you know, that was sort of the easy part, getting the law passed. Um, the truth was we did have big, bad EPA behind us. And even though we weren't talking about that, that is, and it remains true and helpful, I've got to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And because the hard part is going to be in the implementation, the devil's in the details. And, you know, to the extent that we are asking some of those larger impervious landowners to retrofit and the new ones to spend more money and, and the, the towns to, to, to redo how they're managing their stormwater, it's going to be expensive for everybody. And, uh, and there, there will be pushback. So, um, you know, to the extent that all of you in the, this room, you know, are Vermonters or stay in Vermont, we need you to continue to have that all-in message, even when people are ready to start pointing fingers at each other. Lori, just, a, just a, a couple of practical things, John, to think about. Um, one of the things that Secretary Ross and I did was we spent a lot of time in individual farmers' living rooms or at, in the local Grange or the Veterans Hall or the local you know, gathering place or the Pizza Hall and, and talking to farmers. Not talking to the Farm Bureau, not talking to lobbyists, but talking to farmers and producers. And you know, it's not that those organizations don't play an important role, but we found that by talking to the farmers themselves and to the leaders um, and doing it together, I think I, you know, we got we had kind of a shtick going where we would go and I would say how important farming was to the state's economy, how critical a well-managed farm could be in terms of a water quality asset. You know, well-managed farm where the water stays on and the nutrient stays on the soil is actually a heck of a lot better than pavement. You know, from my perspective as a clean water advocate, and so. And then Secretary Ross would step up and say, and we're farming part of the problem, you guys need to step up. And that kind of, I think, uh, whiplash, caused whiplash for some folks. But it was, I think it was sitting down talking to the producers, and it was hard, the hard, you know, long-term, you know, small d democratic work of talking to folks where they, and meet them where they are. So that when we started rolling out regulatory programs, and the Farm Bureau representatives and lobbyists turned to their community and said, what do you think about this? How do you want us to respond? They said, we're okay. We trust those guys. They, they are listening to us. We, we have some concerns and questions, but we're basically on board. And I think, you know, that's a kind of a radical concept at this time where, you know, ideology has divided us as a nation over environmental issues in a way that's really damaging. But I do see that as the ultimate future of our way out of this set of issues. It's not going to be because um, frankly, we win a bunch of lawsuits. It's going to be because the farm community finally recognizes that it's in their best interest to be part of the community of folks that care about clean water because they depend upon it just as the same way the rest of us do. I, I, can I just add one brief sure. comment? Um, uh, I agree with everything that's been said, and Governor Shumlin deserves immense credit uh, both for appointing these folks to my right, um, but also uh, because he cares personally about these issues and made it one of his core leadership imperatives. Um, can't say enough about that. Unfortunately, he announced that he's not running again and we have an open seat next year. So there's a lot of uncertainty around rollout of a lot of these great programs, which makes us very nervous. Um, but the reason uh, that the, the that Emerson Emerson Lynn, the, the editor what that was referred to from the St. Albans Messenger, organized that day. The reason that the legislation passed this year, uh, I think, and Secretary Ross referred to it a moment ago, is because the lake is foul. It's in terrible shape in Missisquoi Bay, in St. Albans Bay, and, and on the Georgia shore, and in the South Lake, and people are seeing that crop up throughout the lake. Might as well be on fire like the Cuyahoga. And that's why it's not a partisan issue anymore. That's why the uh, Republican uh, minority leader uh, wanted to sit down with me last year in the House for the first time ever. <laughs> this is a person that, uh, has not been really positive about my organization over time. Um, because their constituents and they themselves are seeing conditions and we're telling them, we're going to communities. I've, I've been with these same folks telling communities, sorry, you're gonna live with this for 10, 
20, 30 years. There's no near-term hope on the horizon for your property value, for this place that you've loved with your family for 100 years and you can't fire sale now and you're still being taxed at the same level because the local community still needs a school, um, businesses being affected in that way, and whether you're a farmer or a resort owner or a fisherman or a salesperson or whatever, um, if you care about the water in that way, you're seeing conditions that are unimaginable, and that's the big change that has driven what's been happening recently in addition to these great folks appointed by a great governor. We only have a few more minutes left, so, Professor. This is getting a little bit down in the weeds, but tell me if I'm wrong, that under the new Water Quality Act, you're regulating farms, small, medium, and large, and you're defined, to, to be a small farm, you have to be, if, it's, if it has 20 milking cows with 30 heifers, it doesn't qualify as a regulated farm at all. In other words, you have to be at least that size be a regulated farm. So it just seems to me there, you know, Vermont is littered with lots of small operations with a dozen animals that produce quite a lot of poop and pee, and are they going to be completely unregulated? My, my question is, what's your criteria for a small farm? Is it so I'd have to get out my cell phone and read the same thing you're reading. That's not fair. <laughs> so the, I, I, are you reading from the draft RAPs? Is that what you're reading from right now, where we're trying to define small farm? So remember at the beginning of this, my comments, I talked about four regulators to regulate 7,000 farms? So we have not quadrupled that. We have doubled that. And so the question is, where is the greatest impact going to come from? And um, what we are trying to do is trying to define the small, the small farms that will now, for the first time, come under active regu regulation where people are going to visit their farm as compared to only going there when there's a complaint. And we're trying to identify the, the right size farms that really have the greatest impact. We, we do not intend to because it would be a promise we cannot keep to visit every single landowner in the state of Vermont who has one pig, one chicken, and a dog. So you tell me where the right place is to draw the line. And then you give me the resources to do it. Now, so what the, to answer your question is, those are draft rules. We're looking for input as to where, where we should draw that line. And in terms of um, the appropriate place in terms of the, of the legitimate impact and the ability to actually regulate that impact. My, my, think my question is, is, under these draft regulations, what percentage of the animal waste is going to be regulated and what percentage is not going to be regulated? And I, don't, and I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect it's a fair amount is not, it's not going to be regulated. Well, I'll tell you right now, the right now, um, a vast majority of the dairy waste is being regulated because the vast majority of the dairy cows are on the LFOs and the MFOs. So as we expand into the, what we call the SFOs now, the small farm operations, um, we're gonna gain even a more significant percentage. Um, and um, when we start then regulating other farms that are not dairy farms, which have heretofore been in those, that kind of um, lightly regulated by complaint only, we're gonna capture more of that waste. But um, the largest, uh, population of animals we have in the state in terms of the newer generation are dairy cows. If I, if I could just add something, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. I, I was just going to mention, and Chuck, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the settlement agreement that we entered into with uh, the agency of ag of our state court lawsuit under the state um, ag uh, pollution program um, would provide an additional overlay to, to what you're reading from in the Missisquoi watershed, and then to the extent that the agency extends beyond that, it, it's anticipated to look at the South, South Lake, St. Albans Bay, and Otter Creek by relying on the term milk haulers. So the, the particular reference to dairy cow, a dairy operation of a certain size, there may be an additional regulatory hook or program targeted at those specific sub-watersheds in addition to the statewide requirements that you're, that are anticipated in the RAPs. Yes, 
We have time for one more, I think, Professor. Can I, can I just add, Lloyd, there's, but there's, a, a, there's John's on to something, but I'm watching Marley in the back kind of just squirm with discomfort over kind of, the, there's another piece to this, which is that there is, while they may not be, there may not be proactive agency of agriculture inspectors going out and requiring permits or inspections on farms that fall below that threshold, it doesn't mean that those other farms are off the hook. Nobody is allowed to discharge pollutants into a waterway and if Marley or the Agency of Agriculture inspectors or the DEC inspectors find a, a llama, you know, someone who has four llamas that are trampling um, the stream banks and causing, you know, and there's manure piles that are running off into the stream, that is something that is subject to the authority of the state to step in and address. So part of, part of what we can do is if we find somebody with significant impact, we can bring them into the small farm regulatory pro, uh, program. So, and they all have to comply with the minimum standards. But to, you were trying to answer your question about why, the, why those numbers. Um, but that's why I loved having David um, as a wingman when we were out on the street. Can we move on? Because we have just one more, please. Do you want to go? Right. Um, I'd like to compliment the panel for taking this conversation to the substance of what is actually going to be required and not the process, which. Uh, uh, not the numbers, so to speak. Uh, that's what several of us were groping for in our own presentations. But I'd like to circle back to the TMVL aspect of this, if I can, because I think that was really the key point of difference in the dialogue here on the panel. And the sort of generic question is whether or not a TMDO can provide reasonable assurance if it's based on future actions and uh, ADM, um, adaptive management, that if such and such happens, we will do this, and if something else happens, we will do that. Um, in my experience with HCPs under the ESA and forest management plans, step two never happens, even no matter how bad the situation gets. There's always a reason not to do it, or there's a change of administrations, or um, worse, it gets litigated. So step two becomes yet another flashpoint of litigation, both from the environmental side and the affected industry side. So if you can get it clean in the first instance, you're infinitely better off. Uh, that said, as a technical matter, whether or not reasonable assurances ever can be provided by these contingencies is, uh, is a very hairy proposition, and you've highlighted it very well. Thank you. Well, I'll just, if I could comment on that, I, you know, and I think uh, really the, the entity that really at the end of the day makes the decision on this, at least in the near term, is EPA. Ultimately, it may be a court. But th this particular plan is not as adaptive management oriented as it may come across. It's a very substantial plan with a whole set of concrete regulatory timelines and implementation schedules that will kick in. And so it doesn't rely on a lot of future activities in terms of, you know, we'll, we'll adapt to it when we get to it. But there are some parts of the lake where the pollution loads are so large, I'm particularly focused on Missiscoy Bay, that you simply couldn't, you know, un, you know, given the tools that we have today, get there. And at some level, we were at the not wanting perfect to be the enemy of the good and said, let's just go forward into this really robust plan. And we'll, we'll just, you know, in 20 years, we'll, or 10 years, 15 years, we'll see how far we've gotten. If we have to adjust, hopefully there'll be the kind of leadership present that will be able to do that. My, my answer to that is no. <laughs> um, but to provide a little bit more context, um, uh, the most important provision in any TMDL, from my perspective, is uh, an expiration date. Something, and sometimes people refer to things like reopeners or, you know, check-in or framework dates or something like that. But one of the big problems, and we confronted this in our first uh, round on the TMDL challenge, we had eight years of information showing that the assumptions were wrong and Department of Justice was saying to the court, you can't talk about any of that new stuff that actually proves that what we did before was wrong. You have to consider this hypothetical modeling record that we used in 1999 to come up with a 2002 TMDL. These documents become frozen in time on the date, for the most part, on the date that they're approved by EPA. 
and they're only adaptive in the sense that they have some sort of check-in or check-back. And even with that as a direction that EPA is heading and others are heading, um, particularly where we're looking at saying to municipalities in Vermont and around the country based on reasonable assurances from agriculture or non-point source, other non-point sources, go ahead and expand, expand your pollutant load. I would argue that um, the act just does not allow for a reasonable assurances analysis like that. And or, I, I guess I just want to add, um, it's an optimistic word. And so the, the answer to this is, I sure hope so. I sure hope this is the tool because we don't have a better tool. Because if we did just what Chris said and just said, hey, wastewater treatment facilities stop right now, we're not going to clean up the lake. That's not going to clean up the lake. That's 4% of the pollution. So if we're as a state going to work together to clean up this gem, I sure hope reasonable assurance is the way to get there. And I hope we can uh, show the rest of the country that this can work. I feel very, very positive about the efforts that have gone into uh, putting together a proposal, a plan to meet the TMDL requirements. Um, I feel very optimistic that we're going to put in place a regulatory frame that future administrations cannot back off of because it's the law. Um, we're working really hard with our attorneys to help them understand that it doesn't really matter who sits in my seat, the law remains the law. And they've got an independent obligation to implement it uh, and to let our programs know they need to implement. In addition, we've got great watchdogs out there like, like Chris Killian who will be uh, watching our every move, which is, which is awesome as much as sometimes I don't like it. But, uh, <laughs> and of course, we do have the evil EPA. Right, that you know, even though we're not talking about it a whole lot, EPA's back there as a backstop, and that also gives me optimism into the future, no matter who the next administration is. Um, Vermonters love their lake. We're still going to have Emerson Lynn out there saying, "Hey, we're holding you to this." So, uh, so I, at the end of the day, I'm optimistic. I think reasonable assurances, uh, in this case, will will be effective. You want to say one thing, Secretary? Yeah, I would, I would say <laughs> I have to defer. All, everything we, you've heard is necessary, but what is going to make it sufficient is your participation. We didn't get to this problem without your, your help, and to get out of this problem, we're going to need your help. And if you're not willing to help, don't look at us to solve all the problems, because we only reflect you. So we're at time, but I just wanted to thank the panel. You're all uh, extraordinarily busy, but also <coughs> Just to echo what, uh, what was said in the audience, it's an extraordinary dialogue to have. We're lucky to have it in the state. It's a very, very rare thing for a, a, a very difficult problem. And I want to say that I'm so glad that EPA is here, and I don't think you're evil. Uh, we need a robust EPA. We need to support the EPA. So thank you all.